Good evening. God bless you. Jesus is with you. Jesus loves you. Jesus is working in your heart. He's always there. He always has time for you. Always talk to him. You say, well, he already knows everything about me. Yes, but that's called relationship. Talk your heart out to him. Tell him your struggles. Tell him your failures. Tell him your questions. Tell him why you love him. Thank him for things he's done for you. Worship him because he's God. Enjoy him. The best top part of your existence is him. All the things in heaven there's going to be. If there was no God, no Jesus, no Holy Spirit there, it wouldn't be heaven. All those beautiful things could be taken away. But if God, the Father, and Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are there, <laughs> it's heaven. And that's no different now. Don't rely on other things or people for your ultimate joy. Appreciate them, enjoy them. But he's your joy. All those other things can go away. He's your joy. You could have all those things you want and without him. It would, it would be hell. So enjoy Jesus. Enjoy the Father, the Holy Spirit. Walk with him, love him, let him love you. Life's an adventure. As I continue a series on the seven churches, always wanting to learn from them. It's always easy to point fingers at somebody else or a, a different time era. But if you and I lived in that time, who knows what we'd be. And my objective is not to bash any denomination or ministry or church. It's just to teach us we need to know our history. And it's not all good. But God's always had a remnant that's always tremendously loved him and walked upright before him. And as the book of Revelation calls them, are overcomers. So let's learn from these seven churches, how they affect us today, and that we know our history, where they came from. And maybe there's people also other than ourselves that are influenced in a, in a negative way because of what happened hundreds of years ago. I go to India, I've been there a few times, and I see the people and, and the, the pain in their lives. And they're lost. And I think somebody about 500 BC started that whole nonsense. And still people, a billion in India, are affected by those that person or people that started it 500 BC. And Christians are influenced by people throughout our church history. The first church was Ephesus, a church that did many things right, but got so busy in doing what they were doing, they left their first love, Jesus. And we all have to be careful of that. He needs to be more important than anything, even ministry. Or, word of God says, we won't make it. He'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me. Then there's a church of Smyrna from 100 AD to 312 AD, the suffering church. Wow, they suffered big time, man. They're still suffering churches today 
tremendously going through things that we don't understand in America. But it could be coming here, and we know that. And we need to learn to be ready for that day. Then there's the Church of Pergamum or Pergamos last week. I talked about how the church became married to the world and adopted many things in the world, many things of the pagans. A lot of people think they got their stuff from the Jews. They didn't get it from the Jews. They got it from the pagan temples and the pagan people, the priesthood, the vestments, Lent, holy water, more intercessors because they had many different gods in their temples. So you had the saints and you had Mary. You had the, the priest himself. You had the church itself could save you. They began to, they, they took out the power of the blood, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the word of God and the power of Jesus name. It was replaced by a lot of other nonsense. And that went on to 606 AD. And now we're going to talk about the third church of Thyatira, 606 AD to 1520 AD, 1520s when Martin Luther did his thing. So it changed again. This is the dark ages, a very dark time in Europe. We have to remember though, there were things going on all over the world. The church was existent in other places in the world and doing its work. The word Thyatira means continual sacrifice. At this time, boy, I might, please listen to me. Please don't get angry. Because I came out of Catholicism and this took me the longest and I studied it. I didn't want to be, this is the most biggest sacred thing, Catholicism. Continual sacrifice. The priest gets up there, and we're all priests, and says, accept this sacrifice. He doesn't have to, God doesn't have to accept it. He accepted it 2,000 years ago. It was done. Jesus said it is finished. In the Old Testament, they killed animals. And those animals were all symbols of the Messiah. In the details of how they were to be sacrificed, the altar was a symbol of the cross. Judaism was a very symbolic religion. They were symbols, they were not Jesus. They were to be treated holy and reverent, but they were not Jesus. The Jesus, when he did the communion service, he said, do this in remembrance of me. If you have to do it in remembrance of him, he's not there. At this time, the church came forward with what they call transubstantiation, which said that that, that juice or wine in that bread is actually Jesus. And they offered it up. And that's the central point of the mass. They're wrong. They're very wrong. It was the hardest thing. They're very wrong. Revelation 2.18 states, And did the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this. The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze. The holiness of Jesus. And this is the dark ages. The church has become, will come extremely corrupt. Jesus sees it all. The burnished bronze on his feet, that symbolizes he walked it out. He's the only one that ever walked it out perfectly. The only one. He's the head of the church. 
He's holy and no one else. Verse 19, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. Well, remember the church of Ephesus, they did deeds. This is different. This is not deeds like you go help the poor. It was a very bad part of history, actually. They had the feudal system and poor are everywhere. And the, the leadership of the church was living in luxury. It had nothing to do with it. I know your deeds. He's saying, relying on good works as means of salvation. Things got backwards. When a person gets saved, their heart changes and they do good works. But I hear people sometimes will say, I got to have enough good works to get to heaven. They got it backwards. Works does not give you salvation. Salvation brings you into good works. And your love, and your faith, and your suit, all this stuff, your perseverance, it sounds so good, and your deeds are greater, but it's based on works. At this time, they get into penance. You go to the priest, you tell him your sins, which you don't have to go to the priest to tell him your sin because you're the priest. Jesus is the great priest. But you go, then you have to do penance. You don't have to do penance. Jesus did the penance for you. See, that's works, penance. And then the, chur- then the churches were building all these beautiful churches, buildings, and they, and they needed money. And they started saying indulgences. They invented a new thing called purgatory. Not just you go to heaven or hell, you go to purgatory because you're not good enough to get to heaven yet. So you burn there until you get all your sin out and then you can go. You might be a day there, you might be 10,000 years there, but you gotta burn it out. The fire never removes sin. Only the blood of Jesus removes sin. That's saying that Jesus' blood was not enough to cleanse a person of sin. But what they do is you give them money and your sins are forgiven and now they can use that money for themselves or to build their big churches. And you go light a candle. You put money in this little thing and you light a candle. That's back to the paganism again I talked about last week. Revelation 2.20. But I'm against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Yes, there was the Old Testament Jezebel. She was a not very good woman. We'll just say it that way. And she went against the prophets of God. They went against the holy men of God, went against Elijah. Now, you begin to have a new statement in history. The mother, the church. The mother, the church. Jesus nowhere in the word of God calls the church the mother. The church is the wife of Christ and the church are the children of the father. But nowhere were they called the mother. But now what it does, it gives an authority. The mother rules but it's a female thing. It's a form of feminism. And now the papacy, the Pope is superior and what he says is it. And if it isn't in the word of God or it adds to it or takes away, the Pope is right. If you ask people, yeah, you ask people from this background, Do you believe in the word of God? They'll say, yes, it's only partly true. They believe in the word of God unless the Pope says, no, it's this way. Then they don't. Then also began more and more worship of statues and of pictures. That goes back to the paganism again, the idolatry. I was pointed this out when I was in India because there's persecution by the church in India. 
I would preach. Remember my first thing I preached on this outside land, and there's a hillside up there. And I had an altar call, and the Hindus would come forward, and sometimes Muslims would come forward, and they gave their lives to Christ, masses of them. And great miracles and healings were taking place. And up on the hill were people from this organized church writing their names down to turn them into the government so that they would lose their jobs, get beaten, thrown in jail, and possibly they'll lose their whole families. That's what was going on. And they pointed out, they said, look at this church here and look at the Hindu temple here. I said, look at the Hindu temple. And I said, yeah, there, there's statues of gods here, 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 and here. And they said, now look at the church over there. There's statues of God, 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 God over there. I mean, statues of, of these things over here. They said, it's the same spirit. This is Hindus, Christians telling me this. This was in the area where the Apostle Thomas put a church, and that church is still vibrant today in that area of India. Revelation 2.21, I gave her time to repent. She does not want to repent of her immorality. God always gives us time to repent. He wants us to repent, but he would, she wouldn't repent of her immorality. That means with the world. So what happened? What was her immorality? Repent. God began to bring revival. He had three and a half, but three and a half million people were killed in different time periods at this time. There were the Albigenes, I guess you pronounce it that way, from France. In 1170 AD, the Crusades wiped them all out. There was a revival there of Christians and a credible move of God. In the, they sent in the Crusaders and they killed them all. John Wycliffe. 1300s. Of course, he's a great man of God. We know of him now, the works that he did. He fled to England, and England protected him so he wouldn't get killed. This great man of God. John Huss, who, cha- who wrote and changed the Bible into English so that people could read it. They didn't want people to read it. They didn't want them to know what was in it. He was burned at the stake. A man of God. There was another man, I can't even pronounce his name, in Italy in the 1400s. He led a great movement. And he was burned and then hung. And these kept going on. There was more than just Martin Luther, but Martin Luther was finally the one that had the breakthrough in Germany. Also, right at this time, Martin Luther, you had the Jesuits in Spain that were torturing people with inquisitions was not good. And as this proceeded further into history, this church, they came to America. Now you may say, oh yeah, those Catholics. I want to tell you something, and this is history. This is not prejudice. This is history you will not get out of your history books. The American Indian, some of them were given visions and dreams that people would be coming and would be bringing a book written by God and they had visions of the Son of God hanging on a cross, and they were going to hear about him. And when they got there, many of them were waiting for this. But whether it was the Catholics, who they're finding out killed all kinds of Indians, wiped them out in Canada, whether it was the Catholics or the Pilgrims or the Puritans, they all killed Christians. They all, they all tortured them. They all, they, uh, I mean, Christians, I mean, uh, the American Indian, they enslaved them. They were the first slaves in America. And Indians are still hurting and angry about that today. It's so hard to reach the Indians for Jesus because of what they did. And it was not just the Catholics, it was the Pilgrims and the Puritans. Why? They said, this is the promised land. And like the promised land, they had to go in and kill the Canaanites. They had to kill the Indians. That was all false garbage. They were there, and the, the Indians were open to the gospel. And those that would get saved, they would start playing the Indian drums and their flutes and do their Indian dances to God, 
to Jesus. And they would kill him because they said those drums and those things were all witchcraft. This is what came out of this church era and was taken into America. Revelation 2, 22 and 23. Behold, I'll throw her on a bed, remember he gave her time to repent, of sickness and those who commit adultery with her, that's with the world, with her in the great tribulation, and thus they repent of her deeds. And I'll kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I'll get each one of you according to your deeds. When did that happen? It's called the Black Plague. It's called the Bubonic Plague. It almost wiped out Europe. It's historically accurate. Revelation 2.24, but I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I will place no other burden on you. That's the remnant. There's always been Christians. In the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, there's been Christians, like I said, that were martyred outside of it. There's always been things going on, revivals going on in the world and in Europe even, and they were, they were persecuted, and some of them stood in the church and stood for righteousness and godliness. man named St. Francis of Assisi, he worked with the poor. He was a very godly man. He stayed in the church. That's where you get the, the idea of, of Puritans and pilgrims. The word pilgrims were actually called separatists. And Puritans stayed in the churches, not just the Catholic Church, the Church of England at that time, Anglican Church. They, cha- they changed, they stayed in the Anglican Church to purify it. The pilgrims and the separatists left, they separated themselves to get out of it. We still have that today. People, Some people say, I will stay and purify my church, and others say, I'm getting out. I got out. And I don't regret it. Verse is 25 through 27. Nevertheless, what you have to have, hold fast until I come. He who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I'll give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces. I have also received authority from my father. What God is saying What God is saying is that the church, those who are in the true church are going to rule, not this government church. They're going to rule, and Jesus is going to be the ruler. The next verse, verse 28, talks about he'll give you the morning star. The morning star. You see, this is vital. Because the evening star, star and the morning star are the same. The evening, the, it's Venus. It's the closest star or planet we have. And we got the moon, of course. But it's the first star you see in the evening, and it's the last one you see in the morning. Jesus is the bright morning star. He has stayed with us all the way through the night and coming out the other end into morning when he returns. And when he returns, we will rule with him and he's the bright and morning star. And we will rule and he will be the ruler, not the organized church. Let's close our eyes. It's easy to look at others, but are you trying to earn your salvation? Repent. Repent. Are you trying to do penance because you did something wrong? Jesus did the penance for you. As a Christian, you'll be persecuted, but you never want to be the persecutor. 
You never want to be the persecutor. Are you persecuting Christians? Brothers and sisters of different denominations. It's not for you and I to persecute anybody, to be honest with you, whether they're Christian or not. If you're a persecutor, you're not in a very good place. Ask the Lord to forgive you. And don't be in the government church. Don't be, a, don't be off by yourself. Be with other believers. Just know it's the body of Christ. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.